If you would like my dad's videos, please subscribe to QA Insights channel. This is a conversation I recorded from a Clubhouse event in the Performance Engineers Group created by Naveen Kumar Namachivayam today, August 7th, 2021. I started by introducing myself and then I let everyone know that I would be recording the conversation. So here it is recorded for posterity. Enjoy! When Naveen Kumar asked me what I wanted to talk about, I, I said I wanted to talk about how to make load testing scripts more realistic because um, I, in my career, I, I have been a consultant, a, a, an, an actual performance testing consultant. In the last few years, I've been working on the vendor side um, for K6, but also for Tricentis Flood previously. And um, I have one of the most common things that I've heard from clients is I ran my test and it passed and my response times were really good. But then the application went live and it went down. Why? why how can that happen when my tests all passed? And of course, there are many things involved in this, and there are many reasons why that could have happened. Um, environment plays a big part of it. Um, but one of the most common reasons, one of the most common causes for it is that sometimes we make load tests, load testing scripts as in particular, that aren't quite realistic. So when I say realistic, I mean that in general, a the idea of a load test is to recreate production um, situations or scenarios, right? So we're usually given, if we're lucky, a test environment, but it's empty. So any tests that we do on that isn't very useful unless we have the same sort of traffic. So a lot of our job um, as a load tester is trying to compare the um, the traffic that's in the, the test environment to what we think will be the, the traffic and, and other, not just traffic, but, uh, you know, size of the environment and data and, and all that stuff of the production environment, too. And that's what we call making it production-like. Um, I don't know, Naveen, Naveen, have you also had this issue where uh, tests have passed, but then in production, something goes wrong? Yes, of course. Yes, Nicole. So uh, when I was beginning my career in performance, right, I was not sure what to do. So uh, JMeter, I was, uh, the, my first tool was JMeter. And uh, I, I didn't see the option. There were some settings you can change where you can uh, download the CSS file, uh, JavaScript file, everything, right? Like a uh, browser emulation. So later I figured it out. Then I checked that box, embedded resources. Then uh, I was able to simulate almost like production, but not exactly like a browser behavior. So that was my first learning when it comes to uh, realistic uh, load testing. Yeah, that that's actually something that's really good. That's something that I wanted to talk about as well. I think it's because when you get started with a load testing tool like JMeter, I think all of them have it. They have like some sort of recording functionality. And it's a great way to get to learn a, a tool because you don't have to, you know, manually create those requests from scratch. But um, the problem is that when you just record and then you play it back, expecting that that's all you need to do to run a load test, there are a lot of things that you miss, like wh like what you're saying, Naveen, it, it, like with when you are, if you are testing a web page and you're pretending to be a user that's accessing that web page, I think by default, if I'm not mistaken, most tools, including JMeter, don't download the static resources that are on the page. JMeter calls it embedded resources. Um, and the static resources are like, you know, images on the page or JavaScript or other, other things that are different from the main HTML. So that's a problem because if we just play that back, then... We're just downloading the HTML, but a real user would also be going through all of those resources, right? That's correct, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, because my manager, he was asking why it is showing very less. When I access in the browser, it is more than a second. So why there is a conflict in the test result and the actual performance. Then I explained them, okay, this is what will happen uh, uh, in browser. And uh, this is what we are testing in JMeter. So that is why there is a difference in the response time. 
Yeah. And then also with static resources, even when you do add all of those other requests um, to download the embedded resources, usually test testing tools are going to download them sequentially, meaning it f finishes one request, gets the response, and then does the next one. But that's not actually how web browsers behave. So web browsers do it in in like groups. So there's a certain amount of re requests that are downloaded all at the same time concurrently. Uh, I think in JMeter it's called parallel downloading, but sometimes it's like called concurrent requests. You'll want to turn that setting on as well if you're trying to simulate a browser. Of course, if you're trying to simulate, if you're just hitting like an API endpoint, that might not, that won't be as, as big a deal because there won't be static resources, but it's all about matching your script to the real, um, the real life action or scenario that you're trying to simulate in production. That's correct, uh, Nicole. Actually, uh, it's a number of TCP connections opened by a browser, right? So it has some uh, default value. So each browser will have a six or 10 uh, in Firefox, uh, you can, Chrome, you can configure the number. Uh, so I change usually, I change it to some eight or 10 so that my performance will be negligibly good. But uh, in JMeter, when it comes to testing, I leave it as a default. I think that this uh, six in uh, JMeter. Okay. The yeah. number of uh, parallel downloads. Yeah. yeah, and the other thing too is, well, even if you download JavaScript or or any any other um, resource, that doesn't mean, that still doesn't mean that it's the same because depending on the site, some sites have these client side scripts that are meant to run in your browser, but protocol level tools, including JMeter, Load Runner, uh, K6, Gatling, most of the most of the big ones. Uh, they don't run those scripts. They just download it. So when you get the response time, that's not the that's not how long the script took to execute. It's how long it took to download it, which is completely different. So if you have that kind of application where it's running in your browser, then you probably shouldn't be looking at a protocol based tool at all. Uh, and by the way, like I, I do, I do work for K6, which is a protocol based tool, but I'll be the first to say it's not the best tool for everything because there is a part to play. There is a part in the industry for browser based testing tools as well. If you're testing that kind of an application, maybe look at something like Selenium or Puppeteer or Playwright that is going to not just download, but also execute those client side scripts. I think you forget about your uh, previous tool collaboration. Plug <laughs> they have a framework. Yes. Well, I, yeah. I, um, it used to be based on Puppeteer, but now I believe it's based on Playwright. Flood Element is a fantastic tool. I'm still on good terms with the team that builds it. And it is a, a JavaScript. Um, the scripting is in JavaScript uh, or TypeScript if you want. And so it makes it really easy. And it's, it's way more resource uh, eff efficient than something like Selenium, which is... It, it's 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 kind of hard to justify that in for performance tests, but yeah, yeah. So, you uh, you have to match the tool to the job, right? Correct, correct. Yes. So Flood.io is a trace in this company now. So just for information, if you're not aware. Yeah, it's funny because I I joined them. They got acquired. Then I moved to K6. Then K6 got acquired. So I don't know. Maybe it's me. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, okay and those who joined the new, uh, please raise your hand if you have any questions uh, with respect to K6 or any load testing concept. You can interact with uh, Nicole. Please raise your hand so that I can admit you to the stage. And another thing that I was thinking of that can change the behavior is cache and cookie behavior. So there's two things that you want to look at, look at two aspects. First is the cache that's set by the load testing tool. So um, some tools, including JMeter, uh, can have this functionality where they detect whether you're trying to, you're requesting a, a resource that you just requested and Based on that, it may or may not actually pass on that request to the server. So you want to make sure that um, if you're, for example, testing brand new users going to the site, 
they're not going to have a cache, so you probably shouldn't be using that. Um, and then on the other aspect of this is sometimes there's server side caching. So even if the load testing tool is requesting those um, resources, it's possible that the server notices that uh, it's the same request and, and just sends back the same thing. And that's fine if that's actually what, what the settings are going to be in production. But if they're not, then you're going to want to take that into consideration and maybe change it in your test environment too. That's correct, Nicole. Usually I run with uh, with cache, without cache, and then I ask the ops team to clear the cache in all the layers. So I, I will do a couple of tests and compare what is the uh, impact of the cache. Yeah, and I think it has to do with the transaction too, because if you're testing a login, maybe that first one doesn't have a cache if it's like if they've just signed up or something but if it's a returning user and they've logged in you know recently and they're just refreshing the same page then it probably would be cached both by the browser or the tool and on the server side so it, it can have an effect depending on what you're doing. But if your application is a kind of site where everybody's just new and they're not spending a lot of time refreshing the same page, uh, then it probably won't matter if there's no cache. Correct, yeah. And I was yeah, talking... A couple of folks joined. Okay. Yeah, sorry, Nicole. You can no, go no, ahead, keep going. Okay, no, uh, we have a couple of folks joined. So if you have, they have any questions, uh, we can start asking. Hi, Naveen. Hi, Nicole. Uh, this is Father. Uh, I have a small query. Uh, hi, hi. Uh, I have a small query uh, since we are talking about realistic load simulation, load testing. Um, uh, as part of realistic uh, load testing, um, uh, uh, simulating the real uh, end, uh, end user client is one thing. Let it be a browser, let it be a uh, desktop uh, API, a uh, desktop. Uh, um, application or anything, or uh, but um, what about the pattern of the uh, load? Like, um, you, if you see, we call it a day in a life test. Uh, a day in a life test, like uh, um, they take the peak days uh, um, load pattern and uh, try to simulate the same pattern in the test. How do we achieve it? Yeah, that's a great question. I love the topic of workload modeling, and I could talk about it for a very long time. Um, I definitely think that's one of the main things, main ways where scripts can deviate from production, because it's sometimes it's hard, right, especially if the application has not yet been released. So there's no like you can't go into Google Analytics to see what what pages people are going to. Uh, but yeah, if you if you think if your test is just hitting the home page over and over again, but really in production, there's not just going to the home page, but, you know, going through the product pages and then adding to cart and then purchasing something that's very different. And you can't say that, you know, the the response time for the purchasing page is going to be the same as the one for the home page. So there's definitely a, a, a science around this. I'll give you an example. I, one of the previous companies that I worked for was Tabcorp in Australia, which is a, a gaming company. Um, and what they do is they sell tickets for bets. They sell bets, sorry. Uh, so that includes things like, you know, Melbourne Cup and sports and I believe even cricket. Um, but they have a very different load profile or workload model because in normally maybe there's like a little bit of a ramp up and then steady state, meaning you hold the, the number of users steady for a while and then you ramp down. But for them, that the, the most amount of bets that they get is actually just before the race. And it is a spike. It is not sustained. There's no ramp up. It is immediate. As soon as the previous race ends, people are starting to bet and bet and bet. And it goes higher and higher until the race starts. When the race starts, nothing. There's no ramp down. It's a law that you can't bet while the race has already, be has already begun. 
So after the race, it suddenly spikes again. And people are refreshing the payment pages again and again and again, looking to see if they already got the money, if they've won money. So that is completely different. And if you try to test a site like that by using just the gradual ramp up and then steady state and ramp down, it's it's not going to give you accurate results at all. I don't know if it's even worthwhile. So uh, curious question, uh, Nicole. So what is the load of K6 website? Any idea? <laughs> Um, that one's a little bit more, that was not as spiky as, as a race because it's, it's not really time sensitive and it's also global. Uh, so like for, for this, this site that I was talking about, Tabcorp, um, it's a local race, right? So, you know, people from other countries probably won't be betting on it as much as Australians, but with K6, it's, it's a lot more, um, it's a lot more like the norm with with a ramp up uh, depending on time zones because I think the the majority of our users are in the US so the working hours for sure are higher load than anything else and then you know when, as di- as different um, continents come online and start working then it also ramps up and then weekends are pretty low Got it. So, Parag, uh, Pavan, do you have any questions? Uh, you can ask now. Hey, hi. Uh, hi, Nicole. Hi, Naveen. Parag here. Hi. Hey. Yeah, hi. So, just want to know, nowadays, now, most of the applications like Gmail, Netflix, they are into SPS, a single page architecture. So, uh, just want to know, the uh, your take on uh, what is the idealistic way of doing this uh, single page application testing means what should be our approach how there are what are challenges we may face during scripting or uh, how those means there are any ch- challenges with spa uh, workload model so because i'm new to this so that's why these uh, questions i have so just want to know your view on that how we should ideally test spas Yeah, sure. Um, SBAs can be so difficult to test because they're kind of like what we were talking about earlier, where they have a lot of scripts that are run in the browser. So it, they're, the script it gets executed on your end as a user, not on the server end. And then that's that kind of thing can't be done by protocols because until you send, until the application actually until your browser or your load testing tool sends a message to the application server there's not much more that you can do um there are two two different things depending on what you're trying to accomplish if you're just trying to generate load it is still possible to just ignore the ui entirely and just apply load directly onto your application using api endpoints or or uh, maybe it's it goes to a database or whatever that is so you could try to do it from the back end only uh, a thorough end to end test would probably be using some sort of front end tool um, that's because it's not it's it doesn't fall into the standard pattern of how many seconds it was the response time it's more like what was the execution time how long did this element take to render and for those i would definitely recommend that you look towards something like playwright uh, it's it's a little bit different instead of like for a protocol based tool a response time is the time between you the sending the request and then receiving the response right but for a browser based tool you have to be a little bit more creative because it's based on assertions you wait for a certain element so instead of saying how long did it take to download this image you it, it's something like how long did it take for the user for for the machine to render the image on your screen or it could be text or or something like that um i think that especially for spas uh if it is even possible to do it on the protocol level 
it can be very difficult for for scripting there's so many dynamic things um but but yeah mostly you're going to not even be able to do it on that and you should go look towards the browser based um, load testing tools do you have anything to add naveen uh no no nicole you already pretty much covered all the aspects so i have already posted a blog article uh, uh, in my blog uh, regarding the spa testing you can check it out uh, sure sure no, i'll uh, go through yeah you can go through but uh, my uh, blog article talks about from the uh, uh, commercial tool uh, load runner perspective but it can be uh, the approach can be used for any uh, framework so you can uh, check it out okay so means i uh, just want to uh, get this uh, thing uh, basically means we can use uh, uh, web driver samplers available in uh, Uh, J meter can be used for yeah so we can yeah. use those yeah you can use it but I uh, even I tried it but the effort you put right the script maintenance effort and then maintaining the script for long run so that will be very uh, critical I mean it will be uh, you have to spend more time on that okay so means uh, true client is the best solution uh, I don't for this <laughs> I don't say true client is the best. Might be flood uh, mm-hmm. element, might be best, or jmeter uh, could be best. Yeah, so it depends on your uh, what kind of application you are testing, right? Uh, uh-huh. Plus, other factors also plays a critical role before you declare any anything uh, best. Yeah, I sure, would say sure. look at flood element, playwright, and puppeteer, because true client. Well, first, it's expensive. I mean, if your company already pays for for load runner, then maybe that's an option. Um, but I haven't found it to be very responsive. Selenium is also an option, and like what you're saying, you can use the Selenium web driver with JMeter. I don't really like that approach because if you're going to do that, then why don't you just use Selenium directly rather than having to drive it using JMeter? Uh, flood dot io. I no longer work from them for them, so I don't get anything. But um, they actually have a way of taking Selenium scripts and turning them into a load test. So if you already have Selenium scripts, oh. maybe you should just do that. And the reason is that it all adds um, to the to the processing power and memory that you're utilizing, right? So like if you use Selenium and JMeter. Then you're using memory and CPU for Selenium, and then also for JMeter, whereas you could just be doing Selenium directly. And the reason that that's important is uh, you will, depending on how many users you need, if you if you like have a thousand users or something, it's going to you're going to need a lot of machines to be able to do that in Selenium without hitting the max of your CPU and memory. So it's it's a cost. thing as well correct yeah i have uh, extensively worked on uh, true client uh, uh, protocol uh, i think told that 55 uh, not the newer one but the memory footprint is very heavy so it consume lot of uh, resources i never uh, executed with a very high load i tested with one, around 8 or 10 uh, 12 i always keep the number as minimum as possible because we will not have that uh, infrastructure to run very high volume tests Yeah, I think I I didn't get to I don't remember how many users of true with using the true client protocol I I had, but I know for Selenium when I was at Flood the the kind of benchmark that we were using was you can run five users of Selenium for a single uh, AWS M5 extra large machine. And that's very little compared to JMeter which can run 1000 or more. you know uh but that's that's a a cost choice and and you may not have that choice really may not have that option if you need something that's browser based but by the way for for comparison flood element can go up to about 40 users compared to selenium's 5 so way more cost effective uh don't you think uh, blaze meter is an option uh, to run selenium scripts uh, in the recent past we have been seeing Blaze Meter as an upcoming tool, you know, uh, giving so many options. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Blaze Meter is is like a competitor to Flood in a lot of ways. They have a lot of the same tools. Um, if you do the comparisons, Flood is significantly cheaper. 
But yes, yeah, certainly have, in terms of functionality, Blaze Meter is an option. Yeah, uh, I have one more question. Like uh, nowadays, uh, I have been seeing uh, so many projects uh, and team members, you know, our team leads uh, planning to do a load test, you know. Uh, uh, and basically, whenever we do a load test, we generally verify the server response times, right? And then, as you said, uh, the client might, client might be coming back and saying there's a difference in terms of response time in production. So, uh, don't don't you think like no, uh, it should be mandatory for all of us to run at least you know uh, uh, one round of end-to-end testing, you know, maybe using different options like True Client or Blaze Meter or Flood IO uh, by at least running with five or ten users and giving. Uh, a high level idea you know about how it might run in production but i haven't, I haven't i'm not seeing that kind of uh, uh, you know uh, planning in, in the recent projects uh, which have at least which i have worked on uh, we generally tend to give only the server response times uh, unless or until client requests us to run the end to end test and you know uh, include the browser metrics as well yeah, I think that unfortunately for a lot of companies, response time has been it, like it's the one thing that they ask for, uh, depending on their maturity. And the way that I do it is even if they're asking for a response time, I'm still going to do front end tests. And uh, even if it's not part of the scope, it doesn't actually take very long to use Chrome DevTools, for example, which is free. You, you, you can open it up in Chrome or Firefox, and then you run through it with your um, applicant, especially if it's a website, right? So you go there and then you see the timings there. And yes, it's not... It's not the same as a, as a load test. It's just one user and it's dependent on your network. But it's still like if you can record that as a HAR or something, you can prove as well. Like, hey, um, on, on Chrome DevTools, I also got three, three seconds or something. And so then you can kind of justify your tests that way. Another thing that you can do is run these things called like web page tests for front end performance or Lighthouse, which is also in DevTools. And that gives you a lot more of the UI components. And it's very little time that you need to do because it's all automated. You basically just start it and it's free. And I think even web page test will do several runs of a page. So, and you can choose where it's coming from too, because the load, the location of your load generator can also dramatically affect it. Um, recently, I was talking to this guy who used K6 to uh, benchmark hosting providers. And what he found was uh, there was one provider where it was pretty fast for everything except for the load generator in Sydney, for which it was awful. It was like, I think from memory, eight seconds or something compared to the, the very nice like cluster around the one second, two second mark. And that's an indication that the application doesn't have a CDN um, that supports Sydney very well or maybe the Australian region or something. So also that could lead to disparities if you're seeing your load testing results say one thing, but the manual test says another. That could be the reason because are they both from the same area or from is one like a high speed internet, but really your users are using mobile networks that are not very fast. Uh, thanks, Nicole, for the detailed explanation. No problem. Um, another thing that I that I think could affect the how realistic a test is is the think time, because again, with, when we're just doing record and playback, that sometimes does not include think time. Think time is an amount of time that you program your script to pause. And it's meant to simulate like a user going through the page or typing in something in a form before clicking submit. And without that, it's not really realistic to expect a user to fill out, you know, a several page form in a second, you know, probably they're going to take some time to type. 
So this is called different things and different tools. In JMeter, they're called timers. There's a lot of different ones. There's like a constant, what is it, constant random timer or something that has a constant component and a variable component. There's also the Gaussian random timer or a throughput timer. In other tools, it's called sleep. Um, so you have to play play around with that. But I definitely think that has an effect on the realism. Yeah, we have a couple more folks joined. Uh, so guys, any questions, see if I can unmute and then ask. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, um, uh, I'm sorry, Seth. Would you like to go ahead? Yes. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Sri Ramana. Hey, Nicole, I have a, a quick question. So, <clears throat> so you mentioned about the front-end testing, right? So, uh, as I remember, like uh, when I was working on Flex application, it's been like in 2013, I have uh, used this kind of testing where there was a situation I, I was uh, even my response times, my low turner response times are different from the actual response time what the actual client is looking. So they where I use Y slow, long back. But my question is like how uh, I do see uh, like nowadays people are preferring the per front end performance testing. So how does that incorporate it with into normal SPLI basis like uh, normal uh, performance testing with uh, So how does those two merge together? So, and the, the question being asking like, uh, how do you show your results? Why you, if the client asks, why you are going for a front end test? I so think, is there any, yep. sorry. <laughs> sorry, Sid. Um, yeah, I think if it's in an ideal situation, you would present both front end and back end. And if they ask, you can tell them that the back end measures how quickly the server responds, but there are other things that might affect the end user's ultimate experience, like all of the front end stuff. And actually, they say that um, the front end performance issues account for 80% of the, the slowness or, or also the experience of a user using your application. Uh, so it... It doesn't seem, I mean, obviously it depends on the um, the time that you have and your budget and, and that. But ideally, uh, even just a run of, Wyslow was a, a great example, although I think that's kind of in recent years been replaced by things like Lighthouse and web page test and that. Um, but yeah, if you, if you can just do a few runs with that, um, you might be able to justify it because in Lighthouse it even gives you like these scores and it gives you something to shoot for and, and concrete things that you can tell your your team your the development team like it'll say you know your the javascript that that you're um requesting is being requested too early on and it's blocking other requests from being processed maybe try doing it later on and and prioritizing things like things that that are above the fold meaning the things that a person is going to see when they immediately, when they first jump onto a web page, maybe prioritize having a title there or like that initial hero picture. That might not really change the end result of it. Like maybe if it takes five seconds, maybe it'll still take five seconds in total, but the experience will be different because a user is not just looking at a blank page. If there's something that they can see and already interact with, in their minds, they think it's already loaded, even if it's not completely done. Yep. So even uh, and, analytics uh, tool, yeah, sorry, sorry, sir, you can go ahead. No, no, actually, what I was asking, like, uh, see, where does that, does it fit, like, front-end performance testing? So normal load testing is, like, normal performance testing, like, uh, it's different from that. Do you think the front-end performance testing will fit into the performance engineering? Because we are not... Uh, no, especially doing any load test, parallelly doing this one. Uh, it is like you are, you are, you are, you know, you are deep diagnosing the response time, not in terms of uh, load testing, but individual level, right? The page level. Let's take page level. So, what is the necessity of incorporating this performance testing into our general performance testing? 
what do you think so it, it has definitely a place to be holded into the normal performance of life cycle do you agree nicole Yeah, absolutely. I I don't really make as much of a distinction between it between the two. I just call them all performance and you know what you call general performance. That's I think um it, it is it's unfortunate that people tend to think of that as the just the back end stuff, but I think I think performance is both the front end and the back end. And I think they're intrinsically tied. I never do one without the other. so what i mean to say is like very rare we get to i mean i got only one time long, long back in 2013 that was a flex application to do the front end performance thing but after that i never get a chance to do that so so that was my point so actually in front end you can reveal a couple more defects uh, mainly yeah. right the development team they don't uh, uh, compress your uh, javascript or css might not be compressed that will take more time to load Uh, even the dns lookup time also might be like say uh, 50 or uh, 60 milliseconds but ideally it should be less than 30 20 milliseconds so that is also a performance issue so uh, whenever i start my uh, ui performance right first i open the website and then i open the lighthouse and chrome dev tools and see what's going on then only i start my uh, back end uh, scripting uh, for jmeter or uh, using new load then i present both the findings so it is like a complementary to the development team okay uh, Let us optimize the front end, which will improve uh, performance uh, certain aspects, right? So I use my uh, GT metrics for my blog. I use Google Analytics also. They have a performance uh, view. So if you open a Google Analytics for uh, for your website, you can also see the performance aspects. So nowadays, all modern tools they have performance tab in almost uh, every uh, feature. They, they implement this feature in uh, almost every tool. Yeah, GT metrics is a is a good one. Um I also want to add that I also so I do the same thing as Navina. I, I start off with it before I start the scripting part, but then what I also like to do is while the load test is running, I do it again. I run the lighthouse test but this time with a load so that I I can see how what the differences are from the, my initial one when it was just me to now with the full load. That way you get it's like a hybrid test right it's okay. it's still okay. a full load test but it's still a back end test but you're also doing front end at the same time correct i think they have a generous free plan so every week uh, i will get my my website performance uh, from different locations so something is uh, alerting right then i will uh, go to my back end and see uh, if there is anything uh, plugin is outdated or anything i can optimize then i do the optimization then it will back to the uh, within excel like so this kind of tools will help us to run your website uh, smooth uh speaking about the google analytics i i'm i'm, I'm going back uh, nicole when i joined the call so you are speaking about the load modeling and load profiling so you are telling about some australian company for betting and everything so where they they don't care about the ramp up and so <clears throat> so this kind of analysis don't you think it should come from the uh, the pbo or ba so they should let us know right do you think do we have to dig into that level like uh, analytics like google analytics or any uh, like you know any other tool which analytical tools which will give the stats about the path so what do you think our 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 role into involving into that uh, that uh, that level I definitely always ask the team and other stakeholders what they think the load profile should be but in my experience they it has been very obvious that their expertise may lie elsewhere and maybe they haven't really thought about it in those terms um so I always think critically and I listen to them but I also try to find out for myself because there've just been so many times that I've gone and looked and and they say that oh nobody ever goes to that page and I and I'm able to say well actually I looked at the analytics and they people do actually go to that page but only at the certain time or only after the certain stage or something uh so I think it is part of the job of a performance tester to think critically and just have curiosity about you know what if you're wrong though or what if nobody ever really looked at that 
yes, I have faced that situation recent times. Actually, uh, I'm into I'm working in the Kubernetes. It's a rest. I mean, like uh, microservices. So, so they gave me the estimation to I mean, like uh, give me the requirement and a requirement for ten hits per second for one my microservice to deploy in the Kubernetes. But when actually it's uh, it's into the uh, prod. So after one month, the you know your hits per second pumped up for ten to 20 hits per second, so nobody, I mean, estimated. So which, you know, uh, which showed into the 503. So all of a sudden, client came. Why we are seeing 503? So, so they, then I have to look into the prod with the tableau metrics. So there I can see was we need more instances, JVM instances to support 40 hits per second. Actually, estimated is 10 hits per second. So yes, you're right, but th that is the exception of the rule. That's a that's a good story, and I I really love Tableau too. Um, it's one of the reasons why I really like raw metrics, if if possible. Um, but also sometimes it's not a matter of you know the VAs or or the rest of the team not knowing w their job or or anything. It's just sometimes people are just irrational. Like you release one product, but for some reason, people also go more to another product at the same time, just because they think that that was the one that, that you were releasing or, you know, weird things happen like that, that you might not see if you're not looking at the data because things that it's not always logical. Humans just are difficult to predict. <laughs> Uh, hi, Sai, Asravanti. Do you have any questions you can ask? Yeah, uh, I think my question was partially answered by Nicole when uh, uh, she was speaking to Skate, Sid. Uh, but uh, one more thing, um, we are talking about, uh, uh, for example, in Roadrunner, we have this uh, um, a protocol where it will simulate uh, client-side uh, uh, browser interaction, right? So what is the need exactly of it? Because what I think uh, from the front end performance testing perspective is that during our load testing, let's say when you're using JMeter like tool, you all, uh, also download the embedded resources if you checked it wherever it is required. Um, and uh, what my assumption would be like, I mean, what I would be doing is that I will do the full load test using the uh, JMeter, which will uh, uh, simulate the load. And uh, parallelly, I will run uh, the single user test. Uh, if the functional automation team has any scripts uh, similar to like our uh, um, uh, our test case performance test case, I would like to run those and get the stats. Or maybe we could also use this uh, lighthouse tool during our load test parallelly. So my question is, why do we need that protocols? and why they are selling it uh, and making it a big thing what difference does it make so just to just to clarify you're asking about why do we need protocol based tools and instead no, of just uh, using front end ones no uh, no the other way around oh uh, sorry we have this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So you can think of it as they're they're measuring different things. So from the application server to your computer, for example, that's back end. That's the protocol level stuff. But what happens on the computer isn't monitored by that, isn't measured at all by that. So that's a whole chunk of the user experience that we're not looking at because that's the part that the user interacts with the most. So when, you know, when we browse to a site, we're not like, oh, you know, their database responded within two seconds. We don't know that. We just think, oh, the button came up and it was within three seconds or, or whatever. So we think in terms of buttons and fields and images when we're using the site. So it might be that your server is, is super responsive and really, really fast and sends the, the requested resources very quickly. But if the front end performance is bad, it's the same thing. Users are still not going to have a good experience. And that's why it's important to test both. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even I do that, but what I'm trying to uh, understand is that, uh, let's say we have a true client protocol, right? Uh, and the uh, load owner is selling it very hard. So 
uh, I mean, in the free version, let's say if we have a true client protocol for the, at max 50 users, why can't we use those free versions? Um, and uh, let's say you build a script with the true client pro protocol and run it sequentially, let's say um, 100 times during your load test. But in the parallelly in the back end, you also doing the load uh, load test using the protocol level. Uh, I think that will give us a fair idea to understand uh, the client side metrics as well with the single user test uh, when our load test is going on parallelly. So why do we need to run, let's say, uh, using true client protocol? Let's say if your user load is 100 users, for example, why do we need to run 100 users load test using true true client protocol? Um, I don't I don't understand that exactly. Oh, I think I, I understand the question better now. Sorry. Um, yeah, one reason, maybe not a hundred. I, I do think that you've hit the nail on the head that in general, in a sort of hybrid approach, you want to maximize the the amount of users that you're running with a back end or the protocol level tool and minimize the front end one because that's expensive and time consuming and, and all that. Uh, some reasons that you might want more than one user is that you want to still increase the samples that you get because if you have you know 10,000 users or something and only one of them is a front end user the chances of that one user coming across a glitch or or something are are say, still significant and they will affect your results so maybe if you had 10 users instead then and one of the users, one of the front end users um, reported a very high response time, but the other nine didn't. You can also kind of use that as as a way to kind of remove outliers. Another reason that you might want to have more is if you want to test it from different locations. So that might be uh, something to, to do as well, like load generators in different geogra geographical regions. So just to add uh, Nicole's uh, answer, right? If I, uh, so true client, I uh, you know it is, comes with uh, 50 virtual users, but there is also another component uh, called the uh, network virtualization. So the network virtualization, you get only 30 days uh, trial. If you want to deep dive, right? Like a HTTP waterfall, or if you want to have some endpoint latency. So that report, if you want to generate, uh, you need to buy that license. Otherwise uh, you will not have the full complete picture of your performance. Okay, okay, understood, yeah. Thanks, thanks for answering. Uh, Shravanti, do you have any questions? You hey, yeah, thank you, Naveen. Hi, Nicole, this is Shravanti here. Um, good morning to you, firstly. And um, so my question is more, it's sort of curiosity, you were speaking about this betting application, right? And um, even considering like trading applications, um, so trading applications wherein live trading happens, what are the usual best practices or recommended types of tests which we'll usually do? And um, that's the first question. And um, ha I mean, and do we recommend production testing? Of course, live trading, it's not recommend, but what are the best practices or um, I mean, do we do certain failover testing or any such thoughts? Good question. Hi, uh, good morning to you, but it's actually almost 6 p.m. for me here in the Netherlands. Um, thanks for waiting. I know oh, you've okay. been there for, for a while. I'm glad you got your question in. Um, yeah, so it depends what you mean with trading app because um, I, I have a lot of cryptocurrency <laughs> and that kind of trading happens 24 seven, right? But if it's like a traditional stock trading thing, um, it, it also depends which indexes or which stock, which markets the trading application services. Uh, if it's like the American one, then for sure there's going to be an initial spike. I would say before, well, not before, immediately after the bell rings and trading can officially start and probably just before it ends as well, like those last minute 
people um, in, in something like that. And I mean, we're speaking very generally, right? But I would probably try a few spike tests, um, also a peak load test during that time, um, maybe, you know, that time when people have just come back from lunch or, or something, depending on the analytics, maybe that's the time to, to use as the peak. But I would definitely also do some sort of soak test, like a, an eight hour thing to, to make sure that um, it can last that long. I think you also were mentioning different other types of testing, which I, I love, and the question of testing in, in test environments versus production. I, I think everyone right. knows that the ideal is to have a very production-like test environment to have performance tests in, but the reality is that that costs a lot, especially for more complicated architectures and I think that in those cases, it's better to just consider testing in production to a certain degree. I think things like failover tests or, or that kind of thing, you have to think very hard about whether or not that's worth it, depending on the load you get. But maybe your application is like, oh, nobody uses it during the weekend. Then maybe a failover test would be um, acceptable in production. But there are also other kinds of tests that you can do in production that aren't so destructive, right? So, so I, I really love like synthetic monitoring or, you know, small user tests that run continuously throughout the day. This is the approach that I use for my personal website because it's just my personal site. I mean, I don't get that many visitors, but I do want to know about the performance and I'm not going to set up a test environment just for that. So what I do is I have a small user test and it runs in CI CD. I use GitHub Actions. So every time I change something, it runs and every, I think I've set it up to every two hours, it also runs and you get still a lot of data from that, a lot of performance data that can be very valuable, especially if you're doing it for a very long time, then you can actually spot and see, oh, when I changed the template, the response time increased, that probably wasn't a good idea. Right. So just to add uh, my views on production testing. Uh, so usually I run uh, yearly twice uh, in actual production. So First thing is, right, it needs a lot of planning. So it is not like, okay, I want to run the test, so I can go ahead and start the test. No, I cannot do that. So I have to involve the DB guys. I have to involve uh, upstream and downstream folks. I have to involve uh, DevOps. Then uh, I have to plan one month before, uh, and then I have to give the date. So I have to give the date, like say, uh, before Black Friday, uh, we deploy some major features. And what I do is I, I will ask two dates. One is the backup date, and one is the main date. So I will block uh, around three to four hours. So early morning, when there is no traffic in the uh, store, uh, mobile traffic or web, web traffic, right? So at that time, we, we will get only minimal number of uh, calls. So then we will execute only the uh, get methods. We don't do anything post. And also the get methods also, we will have some uh, certain range of uh, test data only for our testing purpose. So only we make use of those uh, test data and uh, so those environment during the VR, then we carry out the uh, testing rigorously, then we present our findings. So this will help us to uh, save some potential problems when it comes to Black Friday traffic in the US. I, I also, that, that's such a good point about making sure things are planned. You definitely can't be, you know, running tests off the cuff in production like you might be able to in a test environment. Um, but I, I also think that there's a lot of value in running some sort of disaster recovery test regularly in production. Again, that's a little bit dependent on, on your situation, but it's kind of a catch-22. Either the company pays for a production-like test environment to do those kind, those more chaotic experiments there, or you pay for people to be on call and potentially have to rebuild, you know, your environment from scratch if if you do disaster recovery in production. Another thing I like is the theory in cons in chaos engineering 
of minimizing your blast radius. So the theory is that you don't start off like from if you have done nothing, you don't start off by saying, okay, let's just, you know, see, let's just close one, turn, turn off one of the servers and see how it goes, because that's a little bit drastic. So what you can do is you can start in stages. So put the synthetic monitoring, now run a load test, now run a higher load test, now try to disable this one component. Okay, now disable two. And then you can kind of work your way up there and address any issues along the way. That way you're lessening the variables, the things that could go wrong in a test like that. And by the way, a plug for K6 here because I think it's the only load testing tool that right now can do chaos experiments in the same script as a load testing script. Uh, hey, Nicole. Uh, speaking of uh, chaos testing, I have a question here. So how does the chaos testing is different from the payload testing? So don't you think we already had the chaos testing by doing the payload testing earlier? Now the term chaos testing is popular, saying that uh, so which will... Uh, create the unexpected situation. How does it differ from the payload testing? I think that it it is different in terms of the attitude primarily. And I, I think you're right that it, there's a lot of it that's like a semantic difference. They're calling it something else. Um, the, the difference, the slight difference in attitude is that in any sort of testing, including failover testing, you are testing very specific things. And you are you already have an idea in your head and you're trying to make it so that you prove that the the end result at least is that the application does not fail or at least if it does that it fails gracefully in chaos engineering what i really like is the attitude is the application is going to fail at some point it's unavoidable at some point someone's going to do something or we're going to miss something and it will fail now what so it's kind of so how, do, how do you go on sorry to interrupt how do you uh, yeah how do you how do you simulate that kind of scenario how do you guess that own situation and I, I, how do you incorporate that kind of situation yeah, yeah. so I, I love that they call it a chaos monkey. <laughs> Netflix called it a chaos monkey was their first implementation. The idea of a monkey that's set loose in a data center and it suddenly starts pulling out wires, right? But that kind of chaos, there's only a certain amount of things that that monkey can do. Like it's not going to be able to pull out a wire for a, a server that's not in that room. So you can do things like if your if your application is on a Kubernetes cluster, um, you can do things like target random pods. Why would those pods be stopped? You don't know. You don't have to. It's yep. it's not a, a situation that you might expect. You're just like, let's try it and see what happens. So you can come up with a list of, of those things that can be done, not, not necessarily likely ones, but um, you can start from there. And if you can find out a way to script that, like CPU starvation, memory starvation of different components, that's already a lot to go on. And uh, to answer about uh, Sravanti's question, so uh, like I have uh, never done any performance testing in fraud, but we do monitor, like uh, Nicole said, in the app dynamics from release to release, we monitor synthetical and real use monitor, they call it in the address. That kind of monitor we don't, but uh, most of the situation, uh, any, uh, I mean, any company or any client, they're scared to give you the fraud to do test the performance testing. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I think. Go on, Sravanti. Yeah. So I think as said to the point, I think as Naveen stated, yes, usually it's not very often which we do in production. Probably like once or twice a year, wherein you are, uh, you'll do only read only scenarios. Even we follow that approach, wherein you'll you'll not touch a payment gateway system, but just the, if it's an e-commerce platform, we'll just do the all the prior transactions without impacting your submit request or so we also follow that approach yeah but that yeah as Navin was stating it has to be a really a planned activity yeah and i have one more question on mobile performance testing 
so nicole as you were saying uh, that most of the tools doesn't have this download embedded resources feature and other things in the initial conversation so what is your take on mobile testing especially with these critical trading applications where in usually a trading happens on mobiles right um, like you get to do at a peak time where in people does access through mobile phones so how will you um, take those kind of scenarios So in in that sort of scenario I would probably um not focus too much on the mobile UI because that's something that probably would already be covered by some automated testing or or even manual testing if if people are doing that. Uh even mobile apps have API endpoints so they can be scripted like that. One difference though is that I think bandwidth emulation at that point would be a, a big con, um, concern or something that you want to make sure that you account for because if most people like if you think about the robin hoods and and that kind of app um they target like millennials and people who do everything from an app and so you also w- with the with using a mobile app comes the increased likelihood of them being on a pretty bad connection and uh most tools are going to allow you to emulate bandwidth to kind of limit um the bandwidth that is available so that you're not getting lightning fast responses or requests sent out okay so nicole do you have any uh, list of uh, tips for realistic load testing any uh, topics to explain I think we we talked about uh, a lot of it already. Um we talked about static resources, cache and cookie behavior, making sure that your workload modeling uh or your workload model is is appropriate for your situation, adding think time and pacing or sleep or whatever it's called, using concurrent requests, um making oh, we one thing that we did not touch is test data. that's one way to to make a a script more realistic. Uh we talked about different user paths and even different kinds of testing from front end to maybe accessibility even to chaos engineering. Uh, I think we've we've covered a lot. <laughs> Correct. Uh I have one point to I mean highlight. Uh, I think it might have covered because I like I joined late Nicole. So type of cause like a- are they are persistent or not persistent also matter so when you are testing the you are you are designing the load test so this is my ad i'm sorry could you say that again the type of calls like what type of calls it is like is it a persistent calls in the prod you are simulating or it's non persistent calls like uh, the action like uh, this is an important key factor which i was missing in my load test so there is a lot of difference between persistent and non persistent yeah calls. the user comes and he, he, yeah so this is the most of the teams lot of the people will forget about mentioning options but this 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 is a key important factor i thought of mentioning here yeah good point um navin kumar i don't know i don't want to push you for more time here but i think hilario has been waiting for a while and hasn't been able sure. to ask a question yeah <laughs> actually I, i i'm waiting but uh, i i just wanted to know whether we have time or not otherwise uh, i don't want to put more go ahead hilary no problem uh so the thing is uh, I, i'll ask a practical question about the jmeter or it can be done in any other uh, tool as well so we record every assets uh, the static assets in the jmeter and uh, uh, like Uh, if we combine all of those and add up and make a sum of uh, the response times for a particular transaction does it uh, give you a realistic load is it like equivalent to what we are expecting uh, when we uh, when we are seeing whether to how to uh, mimic the realistic behavior that's one question and like uh, all of these assets downloaded uh, if we run It, because uh, most of the time the browsers runs uh, this assets or downloads these assets uh, in parallel or concurrently so how do we mimic that scenario uh, inside jmeter or in any other tool 
Yeah, so I think um, you kind of answered the the first question there and that the answer is not necessarily um, still just adding up sequentially sent requests, adding up those response times is not necessarily going to be realistic because of the batching in effect that that browsers do. But JMeter actually has a parallel downloading um, feature. Naveen was saying that uh, by default it's six, but you can change it. So... You, I think that's an easier way than having to manually get the sum of requests, of response times. Uh, Hilario, if you go to HTTP sampler, and if you go to advanced uh, tab, you can see the embedded uh, resources section. Uh, you can uh, check that box, and then you can configure your number. But uh, yeah. don't uh, configure, uh, leave it as a default. That's a recommended number, six. Yeah, but then the requests are getting uh, called sequentially, recorded sequentially. It doesn't no, like... No, no. For the particular sampler, it will behave like a browser. How your browser is sending, it will try to emulate that when you send the your uh, JMeter. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, yeah so I it think... It is implemented the W3 standard, actually. The HTTP client in JMeter, it follows the standard. So it is not a custom uh, implementation. So they follow... All the uh, IETF uh, RFC uh, specification while implementing this uh, sampler. So you mean to say when we repeat the test or uh, replay it, uh, this request will be uh, executing in parallel? No, it tries to behave like a browser. So the browser, however you are accessing, right, the same behavior you can see it in JMeter. Yeah. Okay. So I think it, it the confusion. The confusion is that in like view results tree, it will look like it's sequential, but if you have the right settings turned on, it is, it's going to be downloading in parallel. Yes, uh, you can check it out uh, in the request time. So every request will have a timestamp, right? So what time it has sent, you can see some negligible uh, uh, difference in the milliseconds. Got it. Um, do you have any blog on this, Naveen? I have put whole video, 60 plus videos are there. So one video talks about 30 minutes only about this HTTP sample in my YouTube channel. You can check it out. Thanks. There is another way actually. In the JMeter, there is something called a web plugin. So which uh, yes, is, yeah, there is another Selenium web, yeah. Selenium web driver. So there is actually a very good plugin where we can use that to test the UIs. So yes, basically, I was, uh, will... talking about this earlier. Uh, so yeah, I was uh, I used that particular plugin, but in terms of maintenance of the scripts, uh, it needs it's uh, cumbersome actually. It is very tough to maintain. Uh, it uh, it is uh, it will create a lot of uh, regression changes will be there. So uh, per per personally, I don't uh, prefer the Selenium web driver. Uh, you can go with uh, some other tool like a flood element or uh, some other playwright, but JMeter. It's kind of very tough to maintain for a long run. Yeah, totally agree. We were saying earlier that um, my personal preference is if I'm rather than consider JMeter plus Selenium WebDriver, I would rather just do Selenium WebDriver or JMeter um, just because I don't see the point in daisy chaining two different tools and you have to deal with two different ecosystems as well and and you can both of them can change including this it's just it just gets a little cumbersome like Naveen said I mean I spent two weeks I, I, I mean I've gone mad why I'm spending so much time on this then I gave up then I uh, opted a uh, true client I mean true client just uh, a couple of hours I spend we can create some script so this is what POC I have done so yeah it takes time to maintain the scripts. So if we have a solution to test the browser-like behavior in this tool, so what, like, then why do we need the other uh, UI-based tools? Sorry. Uh, what do you mean by UI-based tools? Uh, like Lighthouse tools? or about Lighthouse or... Uh, oh, uh, like okay. Lighthouse or the other... Yeah, because uh, things like Selenium, they work on um, 
how and uh, when a, a certain element is rendered or when it's visible or when it's clickable or something like that but what lighthouse tells you is things like time to first interactive which is the amount of time before a user can actually interact with a site um, in addition to time to first byte, or there's a lot of time to first whatevers <laughs> and um, they they are it, it's a different set of metrics the exception i believe is puppeteer because puppeteer um has access natively to chrome dev tools and so it is both a ui testing tool and it is it can even access lighthouse metrics so that some tools can do both so are these tools um, like open source or paid all open source. I t well, the load runner is not, and and neither is the true client, of course. But um, the other things that that we've talked about, JMeter, Puppeteer, Playwright, Selenium, uh, K six, they're all open source. I that's my preference. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have Mirnal. Hi, Mirnal. You're not audible, Mirnal. In 200 meters, turn left. <laughs> Someone's driving. <laughs> Mirnal, if you are driving, please. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, if you have any questions, please uh, ask. We have. Uh, we can be here for next two minutes. Then we can wind up this session. So this yeah. week uh, sponsor, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Redline 13 is sponsoring uh, these sessions. So please check it out, uh, redline13.com uh, for high scale uh, load testing. Uh, so yes, Nicole, you can go ahead. No, I was just going to thank you for having me on here. This is actually my first time ever going on Clubhouse and, and actually talking. I've listened uh, a bit before. So thank you for inviting me. I, I always enjoy uh, talking to you, and I really like this more casual style of conversation. Yes, thanks, Nicole. Uh, so uh, Nicole also is, uh, conducting office hours uh, every day, Friday. I'm not sure about the IST timing, but it is uh, 11 a.m. EST. Uh, so you can check it out in K6 uh, YouTube. So if you have any questions, you can also uh, ask in the YouTube chat uh, based on the topic. So please uh, check it out the K6 uh, channel in YouTube. Uh, hey, Naveen. Naveen uh, Hi, Bruno. Go ahead, Murad. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was, I was the one who was driving. I've stopped now. Uh, <laughs> I had just one question for Nicole. Uh, Nicole, uh, I, I mean, uh, we have a requirement in my team where, uh, I mean, we until now we were using JMeter and we were generating loads up to 2,000 hits per second, and the kind of load generators that we have right now are not sufficient, or uh, you can say the cost of maintaining having load generators that can generate so much load is uh, uh, getting too high for us. So we were looking at K6 uh, to generate the kind of load that we are doing. Uh, one thing we observed was uh, my application has a lot of REST APIs that need to be called in a sequence. And uh, the amount of headers that we send, we have like uh, 15, 20 headers in each of the calls. So is there a uh, Java, and I, I know that uh, K6 uses the JavaScript syntax for the script, right? Uh, are there any JavaScript frameworks that I can use to, you know, uh, modularize my scripts in K6? Yeah, you absolutely can. Um, one thing you could look at is on GitHub, there's something called the Awesome K6 repository. And I believe there was something in there. There's lots of different frameworks. That's not that's something we maintain, but the people who wrote those repositories are real users, not us. And there are a few different ways there that people have found. Um, one that comes to mind was like a, a Mocha framework for K6 that makes it just a little bit easier to do things, including adding headers and that kind of thing. Okay. Okay, I'll check them out. Yeah, and if you Thanks. if you don't find it, uh, message me. My email address is Nicole, N-I-C-O-L-E, 
at k6.io. Sure. Thank you so much. And also, if you want to learn K6, uh, I have started a new series, uh, Learn K6 series. So you can check it out in YouTube. So I, we are planning to cover uh, more uh, uh, features in the upcoming videos. So right now, we have around five videos. Uh, again, five more videos are coming up. Yeah, I love sure, them. Thank you. You're doing Thank a great you, job. Uh, yes. So next week, uh, we are going to talk about recording and scripting challenges on August 14th. On August 21st, we have Karthik from Chaos Native who will be talking about the Chaos Engineering uh, concepts. So those are the two upcoming sessions. Uh, so stay tuned and please uh, refer our clubhouse to your uh, friends. So right now we have around 275 members. So let's let, let try to uh, please help me to reach around 300 quickly. Thank so you, thank everybody. Thank you, uh, Nicole, uh, for your time. Uh, hope uh, uh, we will see you again uh, in the next couple of months. <laughs> yeah thank you naveen and thank you everybody for listening yeah and have a great have weekend, a weekend yeah thank you